Hi, I am Jennifer Purcell, and welcome to my podcast, Living with an Invisible Learning Challenge, where we will discuss, discover, and learn more about the challenges and triumphs of those with NLD and other learning challenges. I do have a website for this podcast, and it is called livingwithnld.com. I also have a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter account for the podcast. They are all under the same name, which is Living with NLD. I also have a YouTube channel for the podcast, which can be found by Googling the title of the podcast, which is Living with an Invisible Learning Challenge. I would like to tell you about a nonprofit that I use for my research for this podcast. It is called The NBLD Project, and I use their blog for my research. They are a nonprofit that is based in New York and is trying to get NVLD back on the DSM, and they provide many resources for people with NVLD on their website. I'll provide you with the website for them in the podcast description. All proceeds from the ads on this podcast will be donated towards the NVLD project. Please feel free to explore the other topics on the podcast and hopefully you will learn something new from them. I hope you enjoy today's episodes. All right, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're listening from. I'm Jennifer Purcell, the host of Living with an Invisible Learning Challenge, and I'm here today with Jacqueline, Alexa, and Jonathan. And I'm going to uh, interview them on their uh, about their datability app and um, about their work with uh, dating apps. So uh, I'll begin by having you uh, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I am Jacqueline. I am 30 years old and I am living in Denver, Colorado. Um, I founded datability with my sister, Alexa. After years of ableism and discrimination and just overall negative experiences that I had on the mainstream dating apps, I live with physical disabilities and chronic illnesses and um, really just couldn't believe that there wasn't a safe and inclusive place out there for the world's largest minority to date. And we decided to change that. And I'm Alexa, I'm Jacqueline's older sister. Um, I'm a public interest attorney, as well as the co-founder and co-CEO of Datability. I am not disabled, um, but I am an ally and an advocate. And Jacqueline's really opened up my eyes to what it's like to date with a disability. And I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you guys. And I'm Jonathan. Uh, I am Jennifer's sibling, uh, but she asked me to be on this because I have spent my work uh, in trust and safety, so advising tech companies on how to build safer, more inclusive platforms. Uh, I've done that for about 10 years working within tech companies, and among those, uh, set numerous dating apps uh, underneath the Match Group portfolio, which has a lot of dating apps that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Tinder, Hinge, Plenty Fish, Match.com, etc. cetera. Uh, but now I work as an independent consultant consultants, helping any tech company that requires uh, to build a safer platform. So I did a chat with you all. Yeah. It's a nice sibling episode. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I thought that was cool. Uh, So I was curious, uh, sounds like um, for you, Jacqueline, it sounds like, um, was it, uh, I mean, Alexa was Jacqueline who inspired you to create Didability, right? Yeah, and her, watching her experiences and how different they were from mine, even though we're so similar, and um, just watching her go through this, we were, it was the beginning-ish of the pandemic, and so there was kind of this lull in life and um, a lull in my career, because I had was laid off due to budget cuts due to the, the pandemic, and so it was kind of like the time is now. I see a problem, um, you know, COVID makes it harder for, you know, compromised people to date too. So like the environment we were in, in the t- at the time also really made it make sense. And so, um, yeah, Jacqueline together, we did it, we did it together, but Jacqueline's experiences, I knew that sh- we weren't alone and that she wasn't alone in what she was going through. That makes sense to me. Uh, Jonathan, what inspired you to do your work? 
I was inspired to get into trust and safety early on in my career because I wanted to make a difference. Uh, I believe that tech platforms had immense reach and impacted uh, numerous people and become instrumental just about every part of our lives. Um, and I was of the mind that there needs to be people working on the inside to make those platforms better um, and to make them safer, to make them more inclusive. And so it was a desire to do that and do that at scale. Um, and I felt that tech platforms were the, the avenue to accomplish it. Um, Jacqueline, I don't know if you're comfortable with kind of introducing in terms of what you, uh, what you live with and what makes it challenging. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, I, I was diagnosed with chronic illnesses when I was a young teenager, um, dysautonomia, gastroparesis, Ehlers-Danlos, and then that sort of spiraled into trigeminal neuralgia and um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And I've I've underwent about, uh, over 40 surgeries. And so really from everywhere, like from my head to my feet, um, I and I live with chronic pain and uh, a lot of chronic fatigue. And I live with a feeding tube as well due to the gastroparesis. And the the catalyst for dateability was getting the feeding tube because food is such such a big part of our society. And where what it, what do people do on first dates usually? They go out to eat. And that was really anxiety inducing. And just to think that I had to, on top of everything, explain this this whole scenario. It was, I was really worried. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And uh, it just, yeah, it, it seemed like it, it would be, it would have been impossible to find someone who was understanding without having to go th like weed through all of these people who are not understanding. And I just like was, was really sick of having to, to weed all these bad people out um just to you know go on one date with someone who wasn't ableist um and um yeah and so i mean i live with a lot of symptoms um just day to day but um i've, I've really learned to adapt and to find what makes me happy and what i can do but rather than focusing on what i can't that makes sense to me. Um, I, uh, I'll give a little background of myself for those who are not familiar with, who are listening. Um, I have a nonverbal learning disability or MVLD. And basically it, for me, it's hard to, um, comprehend body language, uh, tone of voice, facial expressions and, uh, social cues, um, kind of like autism almost. Um, and uh, some other challenges I have are with visual spatial. Uh, so driving is challenging for me. Actually, I'm taking a break from that. Um, and um, like picture doing the big picture versus details is also hard. Usually I'm better with details than big picture. And I tend to be more literal and black and white. Um, and so what made me interested in uh, interviewing you all is because of the app dateability. And um, I think I found it when I was reading a blog, actually. I think I saw it like at the bottom of the blog. I thought that was cool. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you guys um, basically how long you've been uh, in this line of work and um, if you have ever done it with other companies or just by working for yourself, basically. I have no tech experience. Um, I think I said before, I'm a public interest attorney. So I do work with vulnerable and marginalized populations. And I always have throughout my legal career. But I mean, beyond like copying and pasting, I'm <laughs> not tech savvy at all. Um, and Jacqueline, you can, you know, talk about your yeah. background. And I, I also didn't have any background in tech. Um, I had a degree in psychology and got my master's in family and human development and um, had lots of other plans until my health took a toll, um, really after graduating college. 
and realized that, you know, the, the typical nine to five lifestyle probably wasn't conducive for someone living with my sort of chronic illnesses. Um, and we just like, when we had, we had this idea to create dateability and we just went with our gut instinct about what we needed to do next. And that's really what has gotten us here. We started, we came up with the idea in October of 2021. Um, then we started building it, learned a lot with like, you know, experimenting with different developers and all that. And then we launched a year later in October of 2022. Um, and so we're, you know, we're about to hit our two year mark and that's really exciting. And and all of this has re yeah, really just been completed by instinct. And, um, you know, we get some help here here and there from people that we can find who are willing to help us. Um, but, I, yeah, I mean, I think at, in the beginning, we literally Googled how to build a dating app um, because... Or, like, where to find yeah. a coder. You yeah. were in the hospital, and I was in the waiting room waiting for them to let me go back into your room. And I think I remember, like... Like who, like how to build an app, like how to find someone who can build an app for you. <laughs> and, and that is probably not the best way to do it because we, <laughs> we didn't find the greatest per people at first, but now we're all good. We, yeah. we, we know the right <laughs> questions to ask. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think that I can speak for both of us that like, we thought it would be a lot easier than it is. And I'm not really sure why we thought that, um, Nothing is really easy these days. And especially when it comes to tech, it's not easy. I think I um, thought it was going to be easy because we were the only like legitimate ones in this space. And so I thought it was going to be like easy to get funding and then the, the, then people would come on board and we could pay them and we wouldn't have to convince them to come on for a sweat equity. So I thought that I didn't like, realize that the discrimination against female and disabled founders is still so pervasive. And I was and like that people would say, oh, the dating app market is already so saturated. And I'm like, that's fair. And as somebody who's non-disabled, like I have a plethora of dating apps that I could choose from, um, too many to think about. But for this, for the largest minority, there is nothing out there. And so, like, and you're just discounting and discrediting their experiences. But that is the reality and like what we've been faced with. And so that's why I thought it was easy, going to be easy. I really thought once we took off, once we launched that investors would be running, you know, coming to us, giving us money. Also, the economy really changed in that year. So it's like totally a different landscape now. But um, yeah, it has been a lot harder. That is for sure. That makes sense to me. Um, I can understand why you thought it might be easier in the beginning and then uh, finding that it wasn't. And um, I kind of chuckled when you said you Googled stuff because I do that too. <laughs> um, I work in a tech actually quite a bit um, with the company that I work for and um, it's a nonprofit. So uh, I basically help with their managing their website and um, managing the app as well. Um, so um, I can understand where you guys are coming from. Um, so for you, Jonathan, um, you were working for other companies before creating your own, right? I was. Most of my career has been working for other companies, um, all in the same trust and safety space and all in tech. Um, and working in tech, I can empathize with the experience of, oh, I'm not very technical. I'm not a coder. I'm not a programmer. And so if anyone tries to say, hey, build me something, I'm like, I, I have no idea. I can, I can tell you about the market dynamics. I can tell you why it's so hard to get people to get on your app and why it's hard for dating apps, especially, but it's not, I'm not the one to, to build the app for you. Um, but yeah, I spent most of my career working in um, uh, for other companies and then decided I wanted to be my own boss. I thought that there was an opportunity for um, tech companies to do more, um, even though the economy has not been great uh, recently. I think that there is an opportunity for them to bring in part-time expertise uh, and save on healthcare costs and all those things that are related to a full-time employee and to bring in specialized expertise as regulations are coming down the pipeline. So there's a lot of new tech and safety oriented regulations. And so that's the opportunity that I'm I'm jumping on with, with my latest venture. Okay. Uh, so uh, basically what I was going to mention as well, um, 
I live with chronic migraine, so I can understand chronic pain too a little bit. Um, and uh, for me, I think uh, what also drew me to uh, interviewing uh, Jacqueline and Alexa was because of um, that your platform seems to want to help um, chronically ill individuals and uh, disabled individuals as well. And I was wondering if you could uh, describe some of the important qualities and values that you feel like your uh, app has for people. Yeah, something that I really struggled with when dating was because I'm invisibly disabled, I was disclosing and I didn't know when and how to disclose. Uh, I didn't know how much to disclose in the beginning. Um, and so I I did try to experiment with that. You know, sometimes I would try to tell someone even before we went on a first date. Um, and then sometimes I would tell them on a first date or I wouldn't mention it at all until, you know, I actually began to trust the person. And unfortunately, none of those experiences ended up working out for me because people were just, they they could not see past my chronic illness. And hearing the word disability, it was like, ooh, like uh, people automatically think people are weak or unattractive. And it's just really hard for people who don't have any relationship with disability to see that we are whole human beings and that like we are like everyone else and it's just I just we have we are disabled um and that is something we wanted to combat on dateability and so we created the dateability deets profile section which is an extensive list of broad terms where people can can select like immunocompromised neurodivergent wheelchair user and that just gives people a nice little snippet of of what you got going on um and we have had a lot of positive feedback about that because people say it's such a relief um they can put that on their profile and and so people know what what they're getting when they look at your profile um and i think that has made people feel more comfortable and just like in included like oh i see something on a dating app that fits me um and that's definitely made for yeah, yeah like and made made for me mm -hmm. and i think that's something that the other dating apps really miss and we're inclusive of gender you know regardless of race ethnicity gender sexuality 48 percent of our users identify as queer and so we really are trying to welcome everyone about 10 percent of our user base is not disabled they're allies and advocates um like myself and um yeah it's been really nice to see this accommodating place now not every I, mean, I can't guarantee that every single user we have almost twenty one thousand users on dateability i can't guarantee that all of them are nice good people that's just not the way the world works unfortunately yeah. and i mean even disabled yes people correct be jerks <laughs> yes um but I do think that overall there is this sense of accommodation and acceptance and inclusion. And I think it's just, you know, it's just easier to find someone whose values match yours. I think we always try to stress, we're not trying to silo disabled people and say like disabled people should only date disabled people. Um, but I, I will say like, from my experience, I haven't been on a dating app in a long time, but it, it was, it's a lot. Like when you go on, there's so many people to choose from. And if so many of those people that I'm seeing, like, don't, like, I just know right off the bat, like, our values aren't going to match. I get defeated by, like, the fifth profile I'm viewing, and it's, like, each one, like, no, no, no. And I'm like, I don't want to be on here anymore. And so narrowing it down to, like, okay, disability or race or, you know, sexuality or what you're looking for, you know, even single parents, like, stuff like that, I really actually think there is, like, that's the future of dating and online dating. It's going to make it easier and less overwhelming and less options. Yeah. I, I think like less options is good. Actually. On that note, like it, it sort of tries to bring back the old ways of dating. Like when you go to a bar there, you, you those people are the only people that you're going to meet in that period of time. Um, you know, like when our parents are getting married, like they didn't have every option in the world. It was really just who they came into contact with. Um, and so our grandparents, they met at a dance. Yeah. <laughs> and so they've been married five years yeah. yeah so like if, if you narrow that down and just like it, I think you have better chances because it is overwhelming like I I always compare it to like going into a 
forever 21. Like that's always <laughs> so overwhelming to go and seeing like a thousand tank tops. Yeah, you just need one black tops. tank top to get <laughs> yeah. shoes from and you're like, this is too much. I need to, I need to go somewhere else. Yeah. You just need like a smaller store with like what, yeah. what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, and that makes sense to me. Um, and I like how, um, you were saying that, uh, neurodivergent people can basically date anybody that they want and same for uh chronically ill as well and um uh and for the race and ethnicity too piece um and then uh for you Jonathan um have you uh experienced um I don't know if you experienced the neurodiverse part but you probably experienced the LGBTQ piece in the dating apps that I've been uh, a yeah. part of? Yes. And I think that what you've said, uh, Jacqueline and Alexa, it, about the paradox of choice, like dating apps introduced unlimited choice. And we thought that was the best thing in the world. And I think for a time it was until it became too much choice. And now you see all the dating apps going back to creating niches, right? Like Match Group, they launched their single parents dating app star right they recently launched a lgbtq focused and even more specific than that gay men focused app uh, archer where they're trying to help you narrow back down again i think we had this massive expansion of more is better and then it's no not so much and i think that the apps that have a niche focus but are inclusive you're an ally, come in. We love that. Um, but it's uh, it's it does have a niche audience. I think that's where the the future is. One hundred percent agree with that. And I, you're you're not the only ones. The big players are making that bet too. Um, you know, they they have the benefit of scale right now, but I think they have the drawback of everyone just kind of sees them as a catch all versus a tailored specific. We are the same thing. Uh, at, at Match Group, uh, we did a lot of interviews with the trans community, the LGBTQ uh, community, and we heard them say, this app isn't built for me. You know, I go through the flow and it took the apps long enough to be able to choose between more than two different gender identities. But then suddenly they did, and that was great. But then the next question is, what are you interested in? And it's again, a binary as opposed to give me everybody or, hey, I prefer this leaning or that leaning. Uh, so I think, being able to have something that is niche but inclusive is 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 the future. We agree and we hope that all the big players are watching because one day we would love to be acquired. So we're <laughs> yeah, but no, I agree. And I think part of what Jacqueline was running into is like you're wonderful and you have so much to offer your catch, but somebody would hear you're disabled or see it on your profile if you chose to disclose that way. And then just be like, I can swipe to the next person who is going to be just as great as Jacqueline. Oh, and not disabled because that's just the way discrimination it's unfortunately that that's how discriminatory our society is. And so the fact that there are so many options, like they know there's a Jacqueline 2.0 waiting just a few swipes away, it's so hard. But I think really dateability like highlights everyone's uniqueness and individuality and like lets them shine as a person. And it's so much better. Yeah. And, and like the disability market is a huge market, as you know. Um, and so we're not worried about like not having enough people joining, but we also see that like we don't need to have a two million you like people user base um to be successful. Like we've already heard of success stories, even within the first month of launching, these two people started dating and they've been, you know, they're gonna be hitting their two year anniversary this year. And that it just shows that like I think at, at that point, we probably had 1,500 people and on, on the app. And these two people found each other and they decided to stay together, even though more people were joining and they could swipe. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's really great to see. I hope that episode was well worth it for you to listen to and that you were able to take something away from it. Even if you don't have a learning challenge, or if you do, I hope it was extra worthwhile for you so that you are able to learn something and maybe journal and jot down some few takeaways so that the next time you experience that cha challenge yourself, you're able to um, learn how to 
breathe through it more easily or maybe not have a meltdown or a tantrum or be able to take away more learning from it and not make the same mistake twice, you know, and um, be able to also help somebody else go through that experience if you have a friend who has a learning difference and you are neurotypical. So I hope you will be able to have those some experiences in your life now that you have listened to this episode.